Hello, and welcome to Waves Open Sessions. My name is Marcelo, and I'm the moderator. I'm here working behind the scenes to help make sure everything runs smoothly. Today, we're going to be having a remixing masterclass with producer and remixer Dave Ade. But before we get started, I want to take a minute to go through the format of today's webinar for anybody that hasn't done one of these before. In just a minute, Dave is going to come on and open up a Pro Tools session to show you his unique approach to remixing a song. Dave will be using headphones during the whole webinar to prevent the speakers from leaking into his microphone. And we encourage you to listen to the webinar with headphones or suitable monitors, not from laptop speakers, so that you can get the best possible listening experience. Throughout the webinar, we'll be having an open Q&A. Feel free to submit any questions you have, and we'll try to answer as many of them as we can get to. You can send your questions in at any time, but be aware that you won't see them in the chat as they'll first come to me, and then I'll read them to Dave one at a time. And we've also got some questions that we want to ask you. Like what DAW are you using? Let us know in the poll. In a few weeks, Waves will announce a remix contest using the acapella vocal from Dave's session. You can download the track at waves.com slash free and start text testing your remixing skills after the webinar. Finally, during this webinar, Dave will give away one set of JLab Audio Flex Bluetooth headphones. For your chance to win, share the link to the webinar on Facebook or Twitter with the hashtag WavesOpenSessions. We'll announce the winner near the end of the broadcast, so make sure you stick around to find out if you won the headphones. Please note, your Facebook post or tweet must be public for a chance to win. And now, I'm going to hand things over to our presenter. He's worked with artists such as Bruno Mars, Beyonce, Lady Gaga, Coldplay, and a whole lot more as he's worked his way up to 122 number one hits on the Billboard dance charts. He's the industry's most successful remixer, and we're thrilled to have him here with us today. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to Waves Open Sessions, producer, remixer, and DJ, Dave Ade. Thank you, Marcelo. So happy to be here today. Um, and I'm just uh, hopefully going to share some knowledge with some people. Um, uh, and I'm just uh, really thrilled to, to make music for a living and produce records every day. It's a dream come true. And it's also a dream come true to, to work with the Waves people. I've been using Waves since the beginning of time. <laughs> And uh, they make great plugins, and, and that's really why I'm here, because uh, I actually do use their plugins um, in every single song I, I work on. So uh, today, uh, we're going to, you know, my main uh, thing is remixing. People know me for, for being a remixer, not just a songwriter and producer. So today, we're, we're going to talk about, um, we're going to open a session for a remix I did for a young, lovely young artist by the name of Skylar Stecker. And she has a new song out on Cherry Tree Records. And the song is called Only Want You. It's written by Tricky. And it's a great song. So you know what? Let's just start off by listening to the song um, I was asked to remix. Here it is, Only Want You. you go. Skylar Stecker only want you. Man, she's going to be huge, you guys. She just turned 15, by the way. So um, 
unbelievable talent. And fortunately for me, I get to to work on her music all the time. So only want you. So first thing, you know, um, and I'm just going to, I'm really talking off the top of my head here today, guys. And hopefully I, I say some some great, interesting things. Uh, but let's just really start about, start off on, on when I get a remix, what's the first thing I do? Well, the first thing I do is figure out what, what the tempo is on the original song. And the tempo on the original song of, that you just listened to is 100 beats per minute. So I have to make a decision uh, what I'm going to do or what genre I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go in or I'm going to uh, produce. And in this case, I, I just really um, decided to... to uh, I, first of all, I, I stretched or I compressed the vocals or stretched the vocals depending on the tempo of the original. In this case, I ended up at 122, as you see on the screen. And um, one of the first things I do is uh, once I get the vocal going and I start, um, I time compress the vocal to 122 using uh, Pro Tools time compression. I'm using Pro Tools, yes. <laughs> and um, and then I, I usually just put a, a kick drum underneath the vocal, see how it sounds, and uh, away, away I go. So that's really, really um, start putting drums together and then... Once I get the drums together, then I start figuring out chords, and um, and I usually, you know, most people hire me because I'm the guy that's going to really keep the integrity of the original song for the most part um, together. There's been a few remixes I've 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 really um, chopped things up and messed things up a lot, but um, most of the time I'm keeping the integrity of the original song. In other words, I'm keeping most of the vocals in. I'm using some of the guitar elements if there are guitar elements. Um, and usually I'm keeping pretty true to the original arrangement. So in this case, I, I really kept the original arrangement there, and I just basically took the song to the dance floor. So um, the first thing I wanted to talk about was uh, kick drums, which is, to me, the most important thing in a remix. And um, I think many years ago when I, when I started doing remixing, specifically, or producing actually too, I, I, I think the first couple records I did, or maybe the first 20, I for sure was putting in multiple kick drums, so three, four, five kick drums, and because uh, I thought, man, if I put four or five kick drums in there, it's gonna be make one humongous, awesome kick drum. And so I, I pretty much realized after doing that a few times that maybe I'll just find one good kick, kick drum that sounds really good, and and instead of trying to trying to get five kick drums uh, to play together. So um, now. Uh, I just find one good kick drum, and so here's my kick drum for for only want you, and uh, the plugins I, I my go to plugins pretty much for on every song these days because I've just done so much so many records at this point, or at least many many records this year. Uh, my current sort of plugins that I'm using are I usually use the Maserati drum plugin, and if you've you've seen me talk at NAM or AES or anything, you've you guys have heard me talk about this before. So Tony Maserati makes a great plugin, and and um, he's mixed a lot of great hip hop and um, bass heavy records. So he really knows what he's doing when it comes to drums and bass. So I use this plugin on drums and sp specifically my kick. And when you pull it up, it just goes right to BD, which is bass drum. And um, let's just pull all these plugins off here for a second, and just kind of so you guys can kind of hear what's going on with my kick. So. Uh, Figure out my tempo of my rec of the original record and the original key. Once I figure out the original key, then I tune my kick, and I'm just kind of getting figuring out the scale of the original song and putting my kick drum. I think my, the kick drum I'm using here uh, was probably originally an A flat, so um, I don't know where this. I'm, off the top of my head, I don't know where the song is, but tuning my kick drum to where it's somewhere in the closer to where the the key of the song. And once I do that, I get my kick drum going. Here we go. So here's the key, guys. Starting off with a kick drum that already sounds pretty damn good. This kick drum without any plugins already sounds pretty great. So, but I I know that I want to make it some fatter, and let's put the Maserati on there and see what that does. Without the Maserati. Okay. So, besides level, it's really adding a lot of low end. And um, hopefully you guys can hear that. After that, after the Maserati plugin, I'm putting Kramer tape on there. And the Kramer tape, I'm really just using for tape saturation. 
and it's kind of just making the low end kind of fatter or wider. It's kind of like that uh, that tire around your 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 waist. It's just making just making it really super fat. And then if I need some EQ, I put some EQ in there. And maybe if I need a gate, put a gate in there. And the gate, you know, up until probably a few weeks ago, uh, I was using gates to adjust the release and the attack on my kick. But check this out. Uh, Waves just came out with this incredible new plugin. I'm going to insert it actually right now on the fly to talk about it a little bit because it's just kind of a new thing. And I, I, I didn't have this plugin when I did this remix, but I have it now. So I'm going to show you kind of how I would use it. Instead of using a gate, and I'm going to use this plugin to sort of just adjust the release on my kick drum. And so check check it out. It's called Smack Attack. It's been out for a few weeks. Is that right? A few weeks, month. I don't yeah, know. that's right. S- something like that. And uh, up until today, if you guys ever, if you, you guys own the Dave Day Waves bundle, um, I have a plugin in there called the Trans X, a transient plugin basically, and it does. For me, it basically is doing two things: it's either softening things up, or or making them uh, at the attack uh, hit harder. So, giving it more attack. So let's let's listen to the, the plugin, uh, the kick drum without it. So you know what? That's awesome. But I want to give it some more release because um, I'm I'm making a club record, and I really want it just to just to that kick drum to 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 release a little more. Let's just see what this does. Watch this. Okay, so back it off. Okay. Now, if I if I also want to uh, adjust the attack on my kick drum, I could do that too. Here, so tighter kick or softer kick. Right, tighter, tighter. Softer. Now, why would I want to tighten up my kick or soften up my kick? Well, it leads me to a question. I'm wondering out there, who when you, who out there uh, likes to use multiple kicks? So do you like to use a single kick or a multiple kick? And you can answer that right now on your screen. Me, personally, I think I just said a minute ago, I like to use one kick and kind of adjust that. Now, once in a while, it's fun to put like a little hi-hat or maybe another kick drum on top to uh, to give your kick some some bite, but using this plugin, um, actually use this plugin. You can actually use multiple kicks, and um, a, a, adjusting the attack on multiple kick drums will allow you to place them in, on top of each other without getting phase, some kind of any kind of phase cancellation. So this plugin is l- actually allowing you to use multiple kicks. But in my case, I'm all, I'm using one kick drum, so I'm us- usually just using it to adjust the release. Or sustain or sustain short long okay cool plugin so that's uh, my kick drum and um, now you notice here I have three kick drum tracks so I've just copied them over now when I'm when I'm producing um, and this is something I've been doing for years because year, years ago plugins really weren't moving as fast as they are now. So I might want to use, um, put a filter on a kick. In other words, uh, let's just check out this, this, this filter here and what I'm doing on the fly. So I, you notice I have my kick drum playing here in the verse. Kick drum's coming in the chorus here. And I want to use a, uh, a high, uh, low pass filter or a high pass filter depending on, on what, I, what kind of trick I want to do. Let's just hear what I'm doing here. Okay, so just basically I'm using a filter to do low pass or high pass into the next section. And let's just check out my remix for a second here and just see what it's doing. And I'm just crazy. I like to have my filters um, and, and move the... If, if I'm filtering a kick drum, I put it on a different channel because... I just rather than worry about the automation snapping back, 
I just put it on another channel. Just a little little trick I do. It's not really a trick. It's just basically common sense, I guess, after you produce enough records. And probably a lot of people are going, oh, man, I do that anyways. But rather than just put the automation on um, this track up here and put all the kicks on this track up here, sometimes I like to have my verse kicks lower than my chorus kicks, right? And it's looking like the majority of people are actually using a single kick. Oh, wow. 62% single kick. Uh, that, by the way, that's super surprising to me. I thought for sure people were, were, were trying, to, trying to squeeze in as many kicks as possible. So that's great. And you know what that is? That's technology. Technology, I think, is allowing people to just, just really uh, crush one kick drum. So it's cool to, to see that uh, <laughs> people are just doing what I'm doing, which is using one kick drum. Um, so that's all my kicks, and, and here's my kick, bus. Um, now, we'll get back to busing in a second. Let's just talk about, uh, so I got my drums here, and this is another thing I want to talk about, and this is, again, not a genius thing, but, you know, um, it's very important to have great organization skills when you're producing or remixing records these days, and for me, I always know that I'm color coding my kicks this color, which is kind of like a brown burgundy thing. And my drums are always red, and my sound effects are always the, the standard Pro Tools default, kind of bluish, grayish setting. My, my sub bass is always yellow. My upper bass is always kind of an orange color. My pianos are always blue. So it's good to have organization. You know why? Because when you're working, you know where to find things, right? Yeah. And so here's my drums. And let's just go down to the bass. Let's talk about the bass for a second, because everybody always likes to talk about bass. So... Here's my bass, and this this particular song, I have two different types of bass. Uh, my first type of bass is a, a sub bass, and let's just listen to what my sub bass is doing. Okay, so I have sub bass up here in the yellows, and then I have kind of my upper, more rhythmic, more melodic basses down here in the orange. So let's just talk about my sub bass for a second and what I'm doing up here on the subs. So I have this cool plugin uh, that I like to use, Radiator. You can use any kind of harmonic distortion plugin. This is pretty cool to heat things up. And I'm also combining that with a, a C1. Compressor, just a standard old school waves, one of the first compressors they made, um, real smooth. And then I'm also using a pusher, which which is made by these wonderful producers, Infected Mushroom. And um, what does a it's it's really hard <laughs> to know what this plugin does just from the name pusher, but basically it does everything. It's doing EQ, it's doing low end, high end, it's doing uh, compression and limiting over here on the push. You can actually get some really cool stereo effects here if you just want to spread things out. Before that, I think I was using um, the internal Avid Pro Tools. Um, um, just the stock plugin. Stock plugin. And so now I can just pull this up, default, and use, use stereo image for that. So that's kind of cool to have a little a little knob on a plugin and, while I'm doing other effects. So, But this plugin, I'm using it just to kind of heat things up and really over limit things. Uh, clip it a little bit, and let's just listen to the bass um, here, one of the basses anyways, uh, with it off. With it on, and I'll tell you what I'm doing. So really, my favorite button on this whole plugin is this push plugin. Hence the name Pusher. I guess that's why it's the most. Uh, it's called Pusher because it's the best. It's the best uh, knob. But basically, this push knob is is limiting and clipping and compressing and in in with one knob, and um, it's just going to really put it in your face. Let's just adjust it. And I, I just wanted to really kind of put it in your face with the other sub. And um, that's what I'm using I Am Pusher for. So, And Dave, real quick, if we could yeah. just go back to kick drum for one second. We kick got drum. a few good questions here. Oh, we're going back to kick drum. Okay, let's yeah. do that. Got some questions coming in. Some people want to know, how do you tune the kick drum? And what do you use for tuning the kick drum? And do you tune the kick to the root of the song? 
Good question. Good question. Let's dive into that. That's a that's a great question and a, and a good something good to, to know. So, do not. I would look. I would not put the kick drum. Um, for, okay. So this kick drum, this particular original kick drum, is an A flat. Okay. And uh, if the song is in A, for instance, let's just do it. Let's just do it like I was going to do it right now. So if this is my original kick, I would use Pro Tools, internal compression, time compression. Go into polyphonic mode, okay? Then I would basically, if it's an A-flat, and the song's an A and my kick's an A-flat, I would just go up one semitone. Boom. And then I love um, using uh, Pro Tools X-Form to render stuff. But Rhythmic's also good for kick, for drums and kicks. So I would not, it depends on where the root is. If the root is within three notes, I would... Um, I would use the root, but I'm, I would never tune my kick more than two or three semitones up or down. Right? That wouldn't make any sense, right, to go more than that? I don't would, think so. Yeah, it would, it would sound pretty, pretty, pretty bad. Yeah. So, you know, figure out what scale you're in, right? And if you're in, for instance, if my kick's in a, if my song is a, if my song's in C minor, Right, songs in C minor, and I have an A flat kick. I would probably go down one semitone to G, because the G is going to work in a C minor scale. Right, and that's how I tune kicks. Was that the right? Was that the answer? That was. Now that that brings in another question <laughs> oh. from Lashuga. He's asking, do you need to know music theory in depth to do this stuff? Music theory in depth? Um, no, you know you don't. Um, you can you can. You you know you can use a couple of tricks, and um, I th music theory and depth. It's it's good to you know you can pull up a, a trick you might want to do is pull up Auto Tune, right? Pull up an Auto Tune plugin, and Auto Tune uh, adjust. Type into Auto Tune what the key of the song is, and it'll tell you it'll show you the notes that are in the uh, in the scale. So that'll help you. Is that a good trick? That's a, if you're not if awesome you're not trip. musically trained and you haven't gone to music school, so I did not go to music school, guys. So I just I just started taking piano lessons at I think age seven, and that lasted two or three years, and then and then I was done. And we'll we'll just do one more kick question here before we move another on. kick Back question. For a question from ACO for all. He wants to know: Do you cut low end of the kick to leave space for the sub bass? That's a good question. I guess you know it would make it would it would depend on the song. You know, there's there's not one answer to that question because it really depends on every song, right? Um, personally, I <laughs> I like kick drum, and this is a this is a, a question I get asked actually a lot at, at NAM and and AES and stuff like that. And a lot of guys, keep in mind, most probably eighty five percent of the mixes I'm doing these days are for clubs. I'm not just doing mixes for Spotify or for um, iTunes or something like that. I'm doing mixes for guys to actually, hopefully, play in nightclubs. So uh, for me, it's really about uh, having that kick push you around the dance floor. And um, it depends. If I'm doing a, like, like my Beyonce partition remix, for instance, that had a lot of bass. So I definitely was cutting, um, cutting the kick and for, to make room for the bass. You can also do some side chaining. Side chaining is really a, a hugely popular thing to do, and um, I don't do a lot of side chaining um, of my kick and my bass. But if you want to, if that's definitely something cool to do, is to get your to get your uh, uh, the bass out of the way when your kick drum hits. So um, I would say, I would say, <laughs> there's not an answer for that. I wish I could say, hey, this is the exact number. You should cut everything below sixty. Uh, on your kick drum and this leave that for the bass or 80 i mean my my favorite frequency i can tell you what that is that's 80 hertz i love 80 hertz for kick drum so i just i don't know that's just the weird number i i love <laughs> okay did that answer that that did yeah, okay we, we can go back to the bass now let's go back to the bass all right back to the bass so i just talked about sub bass let's talk about uh so my upper bass or my rhythmic bass and by the way not every song has has a sub and a rhythmic bass, but this this song does. And if you look at this, so I'm we're going to come back to bussing in a minute, but I like to use bussing. In other words, I put all my groups um, out auxiliary buses. I have my kick, my kick or kicks 
out an auxiliary bus, my drums out an auxiliary bus, my sound effects, bass, sub bass, rhythm bass. So here's the rhythm bass auxiliary bus, and here's that pusher we just talked about. Again, if you look at my the knobs here, I'm really used to using one. I love that. I love that push knob. And uh, I'm also using a decapitator, which is great for bass or great for vocals, even even cutting vocals. Believe it or not, it's kind of cool. And then actually, I have a little reverb actually on the top. And I'm using an H reverb for, reverb for that. So let's just see what I'm doing with my with my rhythmic rhythmic bass because I haven't listened to this in a minute. Let's just see what it sounds like here. Let's engage that pusher and decapitator. Pretty cool. Reverb comes after, but let's just see what the pusher's doing. So pusher's, it's pushing, right? And you can just really adjust this, this push button to see, just depending on how aggressive you want to be. To me, it, to me, it sounds great, either just a little bit or even a lot. Both, 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 uh, both ways sound great. But if you're going to add a little decapitator in there too, I'm going to move this over. So let's put both up there. Okay. So if you're doing both, just de that's going to depend on how much push you have, right? So, so really, I'm using decapitator to brighten it up. If you look at my tone here, I'm also cutting just a, I'm cutting like around 30 or 40, I guess. Heating it up and 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 uh, just just really making it sound more in your face. So that's really what I'm using decapitator and uh, pusher for. And then the reverb is just adding a little nice reverb. Yeah. Yeah. Check it out. Kind of helps the bass. Those, those plugins are really just helping the bass kind of speak to me. And are you using any compressor on the rhythmic bass? That is a question from KC. Good, good. Uh, that's a good question. Over here, I'm using a limiter. So I'm limiting the bass. This one bass, actually. Old school L1 limiter. Yeah, so no compressor. I could put a put a nice Puig Tech uh, compressor on there, but I just no. I, I just I'm you know I'm not doing a lot of compression on uh, my auxiliaries or on my on my um, on my bass because I'm actually going to do some of that down here. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And one more question here yeah. from Switch Twista. He wants to know: Does Dave use soft synths, sample packs, or hardware for his basses? Oh man, it's a good question. What's what's the right answer for that? I mean. Okay, there, here's, the, here's, the, here's the right answer. The right answer is I have a room full of synths and I find the right sound and I just turn on my old Pro 1 or a, I turn on my Studio Electronics SE1 awesome uh, rack and find a cool bass. That's the right answer. The, the real answer is um, these days I'm working on so many songs in one day, which is awesome. I, I'm, it's, I'm so grateful to, to be able to have... Uh, total Recall and, and be able to pull up a million songs. So I'm using Soft Sense these days um, just because it's quicker. And I don't find I'm able, I'm really missing a lot of the authentic uh, uh, sounds uh, by turning on an analog uh, synth. Even though that's fun to do and it's fun to turn knobs and, 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 and really just work on a bass line for 30 minutes or uh, an hour or hours, even though that's fun, um, for me, I'm I'm really I'm 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 remixing and producing, and and I'm not really um, trying to come up with new sounds. I'm able to sort of use uh, effects and dynamics and EQ and plugins to sort of shape sounds. So I, I I'm able to find sounds pretty quick that I think are pretty close, and using a little bit of just quick editing, uh, get sounds I like pretty quick. So did I answer that? Yeah, you did. I have That's to awesome. ask if I answer things because sometimes I go off on a tangent. And thank God I haven't had any coffee today or else I'd be totally talking about different things in the middle of the sentence. Okay, so. Uh, one more qu interesting uh -oh. question here. Another one. Involving the bass and the kick. Uh-oh. Um, Brian De La Rosa wants to know, for club remixes, do you find yourself panning the kick, snare, or bass 
anywhere other than center? It's a great question. Um, he said kick, base. What else? Or snare. Snare. Well, you know, snare. I wouldn't. I would never. I would never put the snare in the same category as the the question you asked because it might be fun to put the snare off to the left or the right. But um, you know, I I don't have the plug in here today, guys. But there's a plug in that I usually put on my drums. Um, made by Plugin Alliance. It's a BX uh, V3. And I only use that plugin for one thing, and it's to make everything below a certain frequency mono. So um, the answer is no, I would never pan my kick or my bass. Um, it might be fun to, to do something like that. But for remixing, and again, for what I'm doing, I'm not making um, uh, a Spotify remix is even though they end up on Spotify, I'm not specifically just making a, a remix to listen on Spotify. I'm trying to make something to listen in the nightclub. And if you're panning your kick or your bass, um, crazy as it sounds, there are some stereo sound systems in nightclubs these days, and you don't want your kick drum on the left side of the dance floor. You want it it's in the middle. So I would never pan my kick or my uh, the bass. I would thicken. I would stereo spread my bass. And but but these days I'm usually just making sure everything below, geez, at 100 hertz is mono, and um, what that does is that cleans things up on the on the low end. So at least for my kick and for my drums, I do that. Not necessarily for bass because bass sometimes you nice you want to have a nice wide bass sound, right? Yeah, and so, uh, one more here from Joel. Could you show us the kick bass sidechain setup that you were talking about? <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm I'm not set up to do that right now, but um, I, if I was going to do it, I would probably and is that Joel? Joel, yeah. Joel, Joel, do do this, Joel. Get, your, get yourself a C6. Here, let's see, Joel. Just this is just for Joel, okay? C6, okay? Uh, actually, you got to use the C I'm, I'm, another plugin. It's a C6 sidechain. Where is it? There it is. C6 sidechain. There it is, Joel. Take this. Okay, Joel, take your take your um, your bass and um, send it out. Uh, figure out a bus for your bass. You got to do it all down here on your bass. I'm not going to do it right now, Joel. But send your bus, your bass out a bus. And um, and um, um, that's not true, actually. I'm going to put the, you guys. I'm doing it opposite. Let's let's do it the right way. So let's pull up sends. Hold on. This is for Joel. Joel just threw a wrench into my whole thing here let's pull up sends okay so pick a bus joel let's just pick 23 or 20 let's pick 2020 okay there's you're sending out your kick out bus 20 right you go to your base and let's just do the sub base okay put a c6 side chain on there joel okay there you go. Bus 20 is going to trigger it, even though it's not really going to happen right now. That's your settings, Joel. And then from there, let's see if there's a nice, there's there's not. Here we go. Base with sidechain. Try that and go from there, Joel. Okay, that'll get you started. That's for Joel. I'm going to get rid of that send because I don't know if I'm using 20 for something else. I don't think I am, but okay, that was for Joel. <laughs> Some sidechaining. Um what did I, I had a sub, you know, I wanted to ask another question to, to everybody out there, including Joel. Um, is, are you guys mixing with, do you prefer mixing with sub or without a subwoofer? So the question is, do you like to mix with a subwoofer or without a subwoofer? Me personally, I, um, thank God a few years ago, I started using a subwoofer, I think about eight or nine years ago. I think that's right when my stuff started sounding okay. It was about eight or nine years ago. So I'm a big uh, proponent of subwoofers. So um, let's talk about, you know, we just talked about the bass stuff. Let's let's talk about my auxiliary bus summing here. So here's a cool plugin um, called NLS channel that I'm using, and I'm only using it on one channel, but usually I can put it on all of my buses. So my, you see I have a sound effects bus, I have a drums bus, and um, in this case it's on, it's on my drums bus, and it's NLS channel. Um, is analog summing. And if you look at these three three names here, Mark Spike Stent, Mike Hedges, right? And Yoad Nevo. These are three three guys that are humongous, um, legendary 
mixer engineer guys, and they all have these they they have, they all have these really huge, massive, expensive analog consoles in their studios, and this is modeling these three consoles. I think Spikes is an SSL, and Mike's and Yoads are both um, classic, sort of probably some, probably some tube consoles, some solid state consoles. And I like to use this um, just to get some nice analog sounds. It's kind of like be kind of like putting a tape a tape uh, plug in on your auxiliary bus as well. In this case, I'm using this, and I like to put this on all of my auxiliary buses. So that's just a kind of a cool plugin. Not a lot of people really kind of use it because I don't think they know what it does. They see these names, Spike, Mike, and Nevo, and they're like, they don't, they don't really. Nevo is can, can be confusing because it, there's, a, there's a Neve console. I don't think Nevo's console is a Neve console though. For, from what I from what I know, but pretty cool plugin. And it looks like the majority of people are mixing without a subwoofer. Really? Yeah. Okay, but you know why? Because they're probably in their bedroom, like like where I started in my bedroom, and um, kind of hard to put a sub in a in a small bedroom, right? Yeah, and there's actually uh, Rob Day is asking if you're mixing tracks for a club, do you need a subwoofer to mix with? Absolutely, man. You're mixing for a club. Well, wh- do you think the club's going to have a subwoofer? If it's a club, hopefully it's bigger than than a, a twenty by twenty foot room, and um, you're, there's going to be some subs in there. Some absolutely. If you can't hear the stuff down, look, listen. I mean, I think um, some of my first speakers are, were Mackie uh, HR twenty fours, right? Eight twenty fours, all right. Okay, and I didn't have a sub for many years, and I wasn't hearing anything on the low end. Um, and it really, um, I was lucky to actually make some okay sounding records. But once I got a sub and I was actually able to hear everything on the low end, it changed my life. And um, something cool about a sub is you can also kind of trick yourself with the sub. Meaning, maybe turn your sub up a little more than it's supposed to be. And that'll actually help you. Because if, you, if you're not mixing with a sub, you're probably going to put too much low end on something, Right. So if you mix with a sub, you're probably not going to put enough. So what I do is I turn my sub up a little bit too much, and that lets me kind of like back off on putting too much low end on there. Actually, it works for me, and things actually end up sounding pretty pretty good. So a now little, yeah. Jay Ish wants to know if you have big speakers <laughs> that cover a sub range, do you still need the subwoofer? Big speakers is what he's saying <laughs> yeah. that cover the that cover sub. a sub range. Um. If they're like two feet from your your head and you have gigantic 30 feet speakers that are on each side of your ears, then you don't need a sub. I'm thinking I'm thinking you don't need to buy a sub for, for that. Um, <laughs> and I think the answer is, dude, you know, if it sounds good, come on. The, the key is you want you want to hear stuff on the low end. so I'm, a, I'm just a fan of subs, subs, sub sandwiches too. I like to eat so um, I have a list of stuff I'm trying to cover, guys. I don't, I don't know, but I like answering questions. <laughs> Let's keep going. Um, so, you know, I think on a lot of records these days, for me, anyways, I, I, I always there's somehow there always ends up being a piano in one of my songs, one of my mixes. In this case, here's my piano. And let's just put this. I have Polly synth in there too. Let's, let's listen to that one too. And I just love this, and I just can't talk about this enough. Jack Joseph Puig makes these great plugins, but I just use this this his uh, his strings and keys plugin. Every pretty much every song, I'm putting it on my piano and my pa- and my poly synths. I'm going to move that over. There we go. There we go. And uh, let's check it out. A four. There we go. And after, let's put engage these. Okay, it's just really adding a lot of high end. But what it's doing is Jack Jack's mixed a lot of records. He knows exactly where it sits. So you can literally just pull the plug-in up and just click on piano, and it's going to sound great. Let me kill the vocals for this. So hopefully you guys heard those. That piano and that and that polysynth just pop out. And by the way, it's because the guys mixed a lot of records. It doesn't have to get. I don't have to get technical here, but this plugin is great for piano. It just knows exactly where the piano should sit. 
So I've been talking about that plugin for, for a long time. Another plugin I like to use, uh, sometimes, depending on the sound, let's listen to what I got here. So like a little poly paddy kind of pad, quick pad thing that I'm using as a stab kind of thing. And um, I'm using an, an Aphex Vintage Exciter as well. Okay, so in this case, I'm using the Jack Joseph Puig, uh, same plugin, guys, but I'm using the synth. It's actually the it's the default, factor default, but the synth setting on this just really is a great for thickening up keyboards. The piano is really for making things super bright and kind of punching out, but the synth setting is just kind of thickening, thickening, um, thickening, thickening. Is that a word? Yeah, thickening up synths. Listen to that. Yeah, so it really it made it really thick, and rather than then put another plugin on top, like in uh, the piano plugin on top, I just use this Aphex Exciter as well, and that's brightening it up too. Ooh, nice, nice plugin. That's just you know what, and it's it's one of those things where you just literally go to the go to the presets. Piano A or B, or though they're both good. Another good preset is vocals. If you want to, if you want to just add a little, a little frosting onto your vocal, this is a great plugin for doing that. Another plugin that kind of does the same thing for vocals. Uh, I could talk about it, I guess, is the um, Butch Vig. Where's it at? Butch Vig. Butch Vig's great for, for 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 me, anyways, for frosting on on vocals. And it just really want to use, depending if you don't want any compression on, if you already have compression going on, just leave the plug in like this and just adjust these presence and air. And that's a great little Dave Day trick. Not trick, but just something I, I found that I like to do. And um, these tube and the tube and solid state are pretty crazy if you're doing like an alternative or indie record, but forget that for right now and just check out the presence and air knobs. And that'll just give you a little bit of frosting on your vocal when you're done, after you've done all the rest of the stuff to your vocal. So when you're done putting all the processing on your vocals. Now, um, something I didn't talk about uh, yet is vocals. So this song, now the vocal already sounded pretty great. So I didn't have to do any kind of compression really or anything on the vocals. I just kind of kept them from the mixer. Let's see if I can get some vocals playing here, guys. The vocal sounded pretty good, so I mean, literally, I'm just putting it out on an auxiliary bus like I talked about before, and um, I just needed to. I don't need that bush fig, do I? So, eh, don't make me hate you. there's my NLS channel. In this case, I chose to use Mike Hedges setting, and just using this one knob, getting some drive on that, some analog summing. From there, I'm DSing. DSing does exactly what it says it's doing. You guys know what a DSer does, right? So, just cutting some high end. I love the DSer on on, uh, on my vo on my auxiliary bus for vocals. Uh, so EQ if I need it. Uh, this case I'm just doing a high pass, you know, big deal. And then I love Jacks, another Jack, <laughs> another Jack plugin. Man, the guys, the guy, the guy's uh, an incredible engineer. So, and I, I use this for for anything from drums to vocals. It's a nice, really super smooth. Can't really hear what it's doing, but it's super smooth compressor and it's just a beautiful beautiful piece of piece of machinery um, and then I got this crazy crazy plug in here called H reverb and the H reverb I'm kind of doing some crazy little trick and it's really just kind of giving me a really tiny sort of um, shimmer on my vocal track because I have a really really quick reverb time 33.33 seconds and I'm just really using it as just giving uh, the vocals a just a little bit of uh, a flavor, shimmer, shadow kind of thing. So that's just like a thing, and and I'm probably going to save that. Yeah, you guys can just look at the plugin right now <laughs> if you guys, if you have reverb, just basically give yourself a nice short reverb time. And Dave, is it recommended to have all the vocals in the center of the stereo field, or do you have the main vocals in the center and backup panned out left right? 
Is this the same guy asking panning questions? So, <laughs> 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 no, you know, um, no. For me, I like to the the lead vocal. Obviously, uh, you want that to be in the middle of your mix. Uh, I, you would never, never in your wildest dreams, in my opinion, uh, pan your lead vocal anywhere. Once you do that, though, you can take your effects and your your backgrounds, which are down here. Here's your background track. And you can pan those funky. I mean, in this case, you know, when I'm getting vocal stems from the label um, or the mixer, you're getting them how he mixed the record. So, so those aren't those are definitely not in the middle. Those are definitely he's got them panned, um, and it's usually around the lead vocal. So, you know, one of the greatest things about remixing records is you're getting vocals that have already been mixed. So I'm not having to mix. By the way, and sometimes I'm getting vocals that are that are terribly not mixed, and I have to redo the whole thing. But most of the time, for major label records, for um, like for this week, I'm working on um, Nick Jonas, and I'm working on uh, Rihanna. So th those those are huge label records at, that have been mixed by some of the best mixers in the world. And so you know, fortunately for me, they already sound pretty good. So uh, I would just leave your <laughs> leave your lead vocal in the middle, and you know your your backgrounds and your effects should sort of uh, surround your lead vocal. And Nick Wax wants to know... Uh, oh, you, Nick. Hi, Nick. Do you roll off the low end in the vocals <laughs> as a trick so that it doesn't compete with the synth lines? That's a great question, Nick. And here's my answer. I spend probably 20%, I don't know if it's 20%, but I spend a lot of my time doing one thing. You know what that one thing is, guys? It's going just to a basic EQ on every single instrument, channel, on vocals, on synths, everything but my everything but my bass in doing this. And we just had this conversation a minute ago about subs, right? Yeah. So you'd be surprised the records I get to remix, people can't people aren't they can't hear the stuff on the low end. I can hear it. And I'm doing this on almost every everything except for for my kick and my bass because I don't want anything to have vocals or you know first of all your vocals shouldn't have anything below 100 hertz right <laughs> I'm I'm hoping or else you you know maybe you have a bass vocal I don't know you're mixing some uh, some some uh, acapella records or something but for the most part every record I have every 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 single record I've ever worked on. Uh, there's nothing in the vocals below uh, at least 100 hertz, or maybe even 150, right? I mean, but uh, so the answer, Nick, is um, yes, I'm killing everything below 100 hertz. Um, uh, but it's I wouldn't say it would ever compete. It's not competing. I don't think your vocal's ever going to compete, hopefully, with your bass, but um, unless you've got a really... Nick's, Nick has a really low voice, so he's he's has to roll up off the low end on his on his voice to uh to to compete with his bass. Did I answer the question? You did. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't sometimes I answer it, sometimes I don't, guys. I don't know. Um so I you know I I want I don't want to wrap up here too quick, but I think I want to talk about uh one more thing which I, I people seems like people do want to know um about my master my master chain and what I'm doing. So the one thing uh, I don't have set up here today in, in the studio is uh, distressors. Um, and I'll tell you what I do with distressors in a second. But So the first thing I do is, you know, I'm using auxiliary buses. Once I get all my auxiliary buses, my kick, my drums, bass, synths, sound effects, vocals, I think, did I miss any? Strings, piano, whatever you want to do. You can get as crazy as you want to get with your buses. There's no, there's no limit to the amount of buses. Uh, throw them all out of main auxiliary bus. And that gives you control uh, to go into your uh, uh, your master fader. And in this case, I'm using a, another auxiliary bus. I'm calling a send and a receive. And the send's actually the send is going out to um, some distressors, and the receive is coming from distressors. So the send I'm doing. Man, I love this plugin. I can't say enough about this plugin. Uh, this came out a couple years ago from Sir Greg Wells. I think he's been knighted by the Queen at this point. Um, the Queen of Canada, because I think he's Canadian, um, and this plugin's awesome. It does one thing, and it's it's it, there's there's a lot of stuff going on behind the plugin. You guys, there's a lot of compression, limiting, EQ, 
uh, harmonic. He has, he has a lot of harmonic stuff in the plugin that you can't hear. And you just got to adjust it. I, I know that every record I do, I want to put this on my master fader and kind of keep it right around here. And you should just obviously try different things and put it on different busing and different try different things. But for me, I just know right around here at 17 or 18, it sounds awesome. And then I'm going into a Kramer tape because you can't get enough of Eddie Kramer's tape plugin. I'm usually using that on drums and then in my master fader for sure every single song. Um, in this case, it's a it's a 15 I inches per second setting, and so it's not super slow, but it's not super fast either. So uh, I don't have isotope ozone on this uh, computer, but I usually use that for for one thing, color, a little bit a little bit of color, a little bit a little bit of dynamic. A um, little bit of EQ. I'm not using it in the old days when Isotope Ozone first came out. I think everybody was using it for level. Um, I'm not using it for level anymore. I'm using it for just a little bit of coloring. Um, then I'm going to distressors. So this will be actually going out, analog out, to some distressors. Coming back in on my receive from distressors. And then I'm DSing again on my master, before I go to my master fader. Just to sort of, I'm, I'm trying to gain some more level with this DSer. Just, it's just, just the same thing I'm doing on vocal, my vocal channel, kinda, except I'm at 16K here, whereas my vocal channel might have been at 15, I'm not sure. Um, from there, I'm going to an MV2, and this is a plugin I talk a lot about. It's also in my bundle that I, that, that I put out a couple years ago, my Waves bundle, and a lot of people don't use this because they just don't know what it does. It's kind of an anti-compressor, if that makes sense. It doesn't make any sense, does it? But check this out. Put it on your master fader, and it's just a little. There's there's a little bit of love, and it's this one knob here, somewhere down here. And I thought you can pull the high level down, and it's basically going to bring everything in the in the in the that you can't hear out a little bit. Does that make sense? The stuff that's kind of down in your mix, it's going to kind of bring it up a little bit, depending on where you put this low level fader. Basically, low level fader stuff that's at low level, it's going to bring it up a little bit. It's a pretty cool plugin, and not a lot of people use it because they don't know what, what it does. Uh, recently, I've fallen in love with um, Avid's Pro Limiter. Super smooth, super clean, easy to use. The character knob's cool. Adjust that, depending on that, that adjusts your, your input and your attack. Um, notice they didn't put an attack button, they put a character button. So uh, that's really super smooth, and I just love that. It's my favorite limiter of the month. And from there, Going back to my one of my favorite plugins of all time. You know, for years I was using an L2, and then I became an L3 guy. And the last six months I've gone back to the L3 multi maximizer. And um, this is a really great plugin. It's a really great plugin to use um, because it, it just basically kind of pulls everything together at the very end. Um, and I'm just you can see here I'm only using two and a half dB of, of gain reduction. Um, but the cool thing about this plugin is it's, it makes things sound, just kind of brings it all together right now. Now, here's a little Dave Aude tip is if you're, if you're going to have somebody master your record, I would give it to them without this. So this is basically for you listening in your studio, in your car or whatever you're doing. And then I would bypass that and then run everything before that, give that to your mastering guy, which actually leads me to my last question. Yeah, we're going to run a poll here. We're going to run a poll. Do you like to master everything yourself um, or do you like to let someone else, someone else do it or do you do you prefer delivering a hot master to the client or do you prefer letting someone else master your song I'm just curious what the, what that's going to come back me personally I, I've been you know a few years ago I probably for 10 years I mastered everything myself because I didn't trust anybody but lately I've been sending all my stuff the last uh, five months to a place in the UK uh, called Wired UK, and they're doing it. They do a lot of EDM type projects, and they're killing it for me. And I just give them a 32 bit master with my um, L3 bypassed, and uh, gives them a, gives them enough room to work in. So that's that's what I do. Um, I think we're gonna we're gonna kill it there. Uh, if we have any questions, what do you think? Uh, how are you gain staging? Okay, Nappy wants to know. Okay. Nappy wants to know how I'm gain staging. Nappy. Hi, Nappy. Um, right here with my with my main um, auxiliary. So all my all my all my different auxiliaries are going into my main auxiliary. 
And from there, I'm again, like I said before, that's going into the send, that's going to the dist distressors, back out of the distressors, back in, and your master fader. Now, cool, another one cool last trick I forgot to say is uh, Pro Tools coming coming back in, just like Ableton, by, by the way. Um, you can actually just push your, ma your master fader here on Pro Tools. You could, you'd, you'd be surprised how much you can push it. Kind of in Ableton. Ableton, you kind of push your master fader until it breaks up, and that's kind of where you leave it, right? Pro Tools, believe it or not, ha it has some uh, channel distortion you can use to kind of give yourself a little more, a little more heat on your song. And yeah. uh, David Park wants to know, do you leave 6 dB of headroom when you send <laughs> it to a, ma a master engineer? Oh, David Park. Hi, David Park. Uh, David Park, it's, a wonderful, it's wonderful to quote numbers. 6 dB. I would say um, there's. I would say even a couple dB. If you have a good mastering engineer, they should be able to to to. Uh, and by the way, David, it depends if you're if you're ridiculously smashing your mix, and you have 6 dB. Is that that's not going to matter, is it? So the the answer there's not really an answer to that question, David. Uh, I would say 6 dB is a lot. <laughs> But um, sure, you can give somebody 6 dB, but the, the more, more importantly is you don't want to ridiculously smash your mix before the 6 dB. So you can give 10 dB, but if your mix is just completely smashed, it's not going to matter, is it, how many dB you give them. And SOL wants to know how hard you're hitting the distressors. How hard? Uh, pretty hard. 10 dB... 10 dB maybe of, of deduction. Um, and uh, here's my, look at, here's my, um, uh, those aren't my settings. I wish I had my distressor settings, guys. I'll, but I like to use like a four to one setting. It's not too crazy um, with a, a pretty, pretty fast attack and a slow release. Um, and it's usually like a, a 10 dB reduction from, from what I remember. Yeah. Does that, does that help? Yeah. That so. helps. Yeah. Okay. It, it looks like uh, most people do master their own tracks. Most people are mastering, mastering their own their tracks. Own. God bless you <laughs> for mastering your own tracks. And by the way, with technology, the great thing about technology is you can master your own tracks. You can mess up your own tracks as much as you want. <laughs> no, listen, that's great because you know what? It costs money to master stuff, right? But, you know, by the way, what's good about mastering? Somebody else, fresh set of ears. That's the best part of mastering. Right, having somebody else that hasn't been listening to it uh, over and over for hours and hours can can have a fresh perspective on your song. That is the reason to, to master something. Okay, any more questions, Marcella? Um, I think that's it. Cool. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, and, and and we're gonna um, Marcella's gonna gonna talk about some cool things. We're gonna give away yeah, some headphones. Yeah, we're gonna announce the winner. Of the J Lab headphones. J Lab's so, an awesome. You guys are excited about that. Awesome company down in Oce Oceanside. I hooked up with, and I'm wearing their headphones right now, and uh, I, I love their headphones. They actually, you know what? They make really cool. We're giving away some really cool Bluetooth, so they're actually wireless Bluetooth, which is crazy. Um, Bluetooth headphones. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks so much, Dave, for that awesome webinar. And make sure that you go to waves.com slash free to download the acapella vocal that Dave used so that you can test your skills and remix it yourself. And the winner of the JLab Audio Drum Flex roll. Bluetooth headphones is Jonathan Lurd. So the Waves social team, they're going to be contacting you, Jonathan. Congratulations on winning the headphones. Thank you all for joining us. And hope to see you at the next Waves Open Sessions.